Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Again, we're going to turn right back to pretty much where we've left off in prophecy, only we're going to jump ahead of prophecy a little bit in this half hour. <clears throat> we've had so many requests to teach the rapture, and we've got a lot of people that have been waiting a long time, and I didn't feel that we should jump the gun and uh, come in with a teaching of the rapture until some of the other things had been laid out correctly, we trust. But anyway, we're going to look at it in this program. So if those of you in the studio audience and those of you joining us on television, I trust you'll have your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. While you're doing that, again, we like to remind everyone that all these programs all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 are available on videotape. If you're interested, uh, give us a call or drop us a note and we'll let you know what's available. Also, the first 24 lessons were transcribed and they are now available in print form. So anyway, if you're interested in uh, a videotape or in uh, book one or book two, drop us a line or give us a call and we'll be glad to get them out to you. Now then, for those of you here in the studio, let's get right back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to talk about what we call the rapture, and I'm well aware of the fact that the word per se is not in our King James or in most of our English, although the word is in the German translation. And uh, as I pointed out a few weeks ago, <clears throat> the word used most generally by the early translators, that is before 1511 or 1611, uh, was the departure or that departing from one place to another. And we have coined the word rapture. Now, you see, I'm, I'm prone to, to make uh, mistakes once in a while, and I made another one in the last program. I said southeast of Jerusalem, but I put southwest, so uh, that's one of the benefits of having a break time. While uh, everyone is not having coffee, I changed that from southeast to southwest, uh, southwest to southeast, because we're going down toward Petra, which of course is east and south of Jerusalem. Well, anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the whole chapter deals with resurrection where Paul is using various allusions to it, allegories, or whatever you want to say, and how that all through nature we have this whole concept of resurrection from one state to another. And, uh, and as he has been explaining all this concerning resurrection, he comes down to verse 51, and the casual reader again doesn't, doesn't catch this. But he says, Behold, I show you a what? Mystery. mystery. And the word mystery is a secret. And indeed it has been a secret. How many times haven't I said over the last eight or ten programs now that there is not a hint, not even the foggiest hint, anywhere up through the Old Testament, all through the Gospels, into the book of Acts, is there a single hint of a group of people who are going to be alive and be suddenly taken off the scene, which of course we call the rapture. And the reason is it's a church age phenomena and only one writer in scripture writes concerning the church and that's the Apostle Paul. And so it stands to reason that from this man's writing we get the teaching concerning the church, which is the rapture. It is a church age doctrine. No one else was ever told to look for this, but the church age has been warned and has been uh, uh, advised to look for it ever since Paul's own experience, as we saw a few weeks ago in Thessalonians. He had taught the Thessalonian believers that this thing was going to take place probably in their lifetime, but it's an event that you can't put a date on. And that's why I bristle when anyone tries to say, well, on September such and such a day and such and such a year, the Lord's coming for the church. We don't know that. You can never set a date, but we are to expect it at any moment. The word we use is imminent. He may come this afternoon before we leave the studio. He may come before we get home this afternoon. He may come tomorrow. He may come next week. It may be sometime down the road. We don't know. 
We can't even speculate because this is something that is waiting for, remember, the last sinner to be saved and brought into the body. The body of Christ is complete. God takes it out, and then shortly thereafter, I don't know how soon after, but shortly thereafter, the Antichrist is going to sign this treaty with Israel. Now, we've had, like I said, so many requests from our listening audience especially to teach the rapture, and I've had to hold them off, and now we'll, we'll try it for at least one program, and maybe we'll even have to go into another one at our next taping. But now Paul says, Behold, I show you, or I reveal to you, a secret. We, now remember, Paul always includes himself amongst us as believers. We believers shall not all sleep or die a physical death, but we shall, what's the next word? All, not just the most spiritual, not just the most devoted, but every believer is going to be what? Changed, changed. Why? Verse 52, or how? In a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Now, I think the Greek here implies down to the smallest part of time. In other words, it won't be in a blink of an eye. It's going to be about in a thousandth of a blink of an eye. Just instantly, we're going to be gone. And I think one of the ladies asked me the other night, well, what are people going to think when they see our dead bodies and we're gone? Well, no, they're not going to see our dead body. They're not going to see any trace of us except what we've left behind, maybe our clothes and our material goods. That's going to stay. But this body is going to suddenly change. Now, maybe some theologian would rebel at my analogy, but I like to think of the metamorphosis of the butterfly. But like with every earthly illustration of a spiritual truth, you can't take it from start to finish. I mean, nothing will nor will this one. But in essence, in essence, what, what does that beautiful butterfly look like before it's changed? Well, it's an ugly old cocoon in which there's an ugly worm, right? And yet, after it's gone through that metamorphosis, what comes out of that ugliness, that beautiful butterfly? Now, Put ourselves, put ourselves in that same situation. Here we are in this old, ugly frame of dust. And I've had so many people say, Les, am I going to have a better looking body than what I got now? Well, yeah, we're going to get a new body. It's going to be a glorious one. And here we are in this old frame of dust. It's prone to sin and corruption and all of its faults. But all of a sudden, in a split second, not over a matter of hours like a butterfly, but in a split, split second, those of us who know the Lord and are alive are suddenly going to be changed. On the way, before we hit the ceiling, we're going to have that new body. We're not going to leave this one behind. It's going to be changed. Now read on. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now you know the trump has always been used in Scripture to, to announce, even in Israel. They, they blew the trumpet for various reasons of gathering the people of Israel together. Now, I know that the church is not Israel, but nevertheless, God is sovereign, and He can use whatever He wants to use, and He's going to blow a trumpet, and we're going to hear it. And the trumpet shall sound, <clears throat> and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, watch the language here. The first to respond to that trumpet call will be the dead. Well, now Paul shows back, now turn back a page with me, or at least in my Bible, to chapter 15, verse 23. All of the human race is not going to be resurrected at the same moment. There's going to be divisions. Here in chapter 15, verse 23, Paul says, but every man in his own order, and the word order again in the Greek is a military term, a, a term of organization. So he might say, every man in his own company or battalion or division. See, it's a term of organization. So there's going to be several resurrections of the believers, not all at the same time. 
but rather close in proximity, of course. But since Paul is writing to the church, the only resurrection that he is dealing with here in verse 52 and 53 now again is the resurrection of the body of Christ. This will not include the Old Testament believers. Naturally, it can include the tribulation because that hasn't even happened yet. So what we have here is the outcalling or the resurrection of the church age believer only. Now, if we've got time, and I'll bet we won't have, but if we have time, I'll show you how these resurrections are ordered throughout Scripture. So for now, let's just deal with the church age believer. Those of us who have come in by believing the gospel, not by anything we've worked for, but by believing the gospel. Then it says, the dead will be raised first, they'll be resurrected, they'll naturally have their new body, and then Paul says, we who are alive and living shall be changed. Why? For the corruptible, this body that is prone to death, has to put on incorruption because we're going to live for eternity now. And so we have to have a body fit for eternity, and that's what we'll get in that split instance from here to there. And then this mortal, which is prone to die, must put on immortality so that we can never die. So then when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption and so on and so forth, then we can rejoice that death is finally swallowed up in victory. We'll never again have to face the prospect of death. All right, now I'd like to go to 1 Thessalonians, where Paul lays it out even more clearly than he has here in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Drop down to verse 13. And again, he uses almost the same language that he used back there in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, I would not have you to be ignorant. Now, when I read something like that, what I do is stop and think for a minute. Why would Paul think that I or anyone else may be ignorant of these things? Well, because we've never heard it before. Paul is the first one to reveal it. And so he says, I'm going to bring you out of your ignorance. I'm going to reveal something to you, see? And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren concerning them who are asleep or who have died physical death. And every one of us have, have already experienced the loss of loved ones. Parents, next of kin, friends, see? All right, now he says, concerning those who have died, that you, as a believer now, sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. Now what is Paul recognizing? That when a pagan or a lost person who has no concept of what's out there, when they lose a loved one, what do they do? Hey, they fall apart. They scream. Have you ever heard the pagans at a funeral? Oh, they weep and they wail. We've had missionaries years back, especially when, when the dark areas of Africa were still basically uncivilized. And, and some of the uncivilized areas of even now, well, the uh, South Pacific, Indonesia, and so forth. There are still uncivilized people back in there. Areas of the Amazon Valley, uncivilized. When they lose a loved one, they weep and they wail and they carry on for days. Why? They know they'll never see that person again. They're gone. Now, Paul says, the believer doesn't have to do that. Now, we can lose a loved one and, and suffer loss, and we can mourn. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think it's ridiculous when Christians try to put on a bold front and just simply say, well, I'm a believer. I'm going to see my wife again. I don't have to cry at her death. That's, that's not right. We're going to mourn the loss of our loved ones, and that's absolutely correct. But we don't have to just fall apart and, and weep and wail days on end. Why? Because we know we're going to see them again. And so this is what Paul is referring to. That you sorrow not, even as those who have no hope, that they'll never see their loved one again. We will. 
assuming, of course, that our loved ones are also believers. Now then, here in verse 14, Paul makes it as simple as any place in Scripture how to be involved in this departure if we're alive or to be resurrected from the dead if we do go through death. How can we know that we will not be left behind to go into these awful, terrible days of tribulation? How can we know that we'll be in that group that will depart? Well, here it is in simple language. For if we repent and are baptized and have joined the church. See, it doesn't say that. Paul doesn't make that a requirement. But what is the requirement? If we believe, but not just anything. You remember a long time ago I put it on the board? There's a big difference between believing in God and there's believing God. Remember that? Now when you believe God, that's being a man or woman of faith. You're doing what God has said. You're resting on it. Now here is the perfect example. What has God said concerning the gospel? That it is the power of God unto salvation. And here Paul puts it right in plain language, for if we believe, what? that Jesus died and rose again. Now, turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 15 again, <clears throat> where you'll find in the clearest and the simplest language in your New Testament the plan of salvation. That which will take a person to glory, whether it's by way of death in the resurrection or by way of the rapture. And it's the only way the only way, and I don't care whether we're Methodists or Catholics or Baptists or whatever, there's only one way to be assured of glory. And here it is. This isn't my idea. This isn't my interpretation. This is what the book says in, again, plain English. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel. Now watch it. It doesn't say a gospel. If a translation does, they're violating it. But I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which also I have received, and wherein you stand positionally. See? What does Ephesians tell us? Above all, stand. Well, what are we to stand in? This gospel. This gospel. And again, it's not a Methodist gospel, it's not a Baptist gospel, it's not a Catholic gospel, it's not any other name that you can put on it, it's the gospel. Verse 2, by which also you are definitive, what? Saved. Saved. Now a lot of people don't like that word, but it's a, it's a simple word that we use in the secular world, and it denotes a salvation. How many times haven't you heard of an individual being saved from financial ruin? Now, don't we use the term? Sure we do. And we use that very same term of salvation in the same way. Boy, that guy's death of his rich uncle was his what? It was his salvation. Why? It saved him from financial ruin. Now, it's the same way in the spiritual. Paul says this gospel is what makes salvation possible. It's by this gospel that we're saved, but we have to understand. And he says, keep in memory, know what you've believed. What he says, I've preached unto you, lest you believe in vain. Oh, too many people don't know what they believe. They, they've got some concocted idea and they can't put it in the words and they hope they'll make it. Listen, it's so plain. We are to believe the gospel. Now here it is. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that, Paul says, which I received. Well, where did he receive it? From the ascended, glorified Lord. After his death, after his burial, after his resurrection, after his ascension. And now God reveals to this apostle of the Gentiles, that's what he calls himself over and over, how that salvation is not in the law, it's not in works. It's not in repentance and baptism. It's in what? Believing the gospel. See? And oh, 
It's too simple for most people, and yet I've said over the years, this gospel, this power of it is so complex, I can't understand it, and I don't think any other human being can, but we take it by faith. And here, now read on. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. And he didn't stay dead, but he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now that's the gospel. That's the gospel, see? Now let's come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where now then we've identified the vehicle for being in on this great event. It's by believing that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Now that's just not a head ascent. That's just not a, well, yeah, I believe that he died. I believe he rose again. No, that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about every individual coming to the place where they genuinely, genuinely, totally, and completely can rest on the fact that when Christ died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When he rose from the dead, I was rose from deadness in sin and the old Adamic estate, and he has imparted eternal life. Now that's the gospel, see, and I, I mentioned in one of my classes the other night. It's pictured so beautifully in Israel coming out of Egypt. What was Israel's lot? Slavery, bondage. But as a result of the blood of the Passover lamb, they escaped the death angel, but they didn't stay in Egypt. Where'd they go? Through that Red Sea experience was a picture again of the burial and the death of Christ, and they come out on the other side, what kind of a people? Redeemed, see? Oh, they didn't work for it. It was all the power of God. But it had to have the shed blood, indicative of Christ's death. They had to go through a burial experience, the Red Sea, and they came through on the other side, a redeemed people, a resurrection experience, and we go through that same process. All right, now let's move on quickly. For Paul says in verse 15 now, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. See, the ascended Christ revealed this to the apostle, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not precede or go ahead of them who have died. Why? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, see, remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, and the dead in Christ. Now, no lost dead are going to come out of the grave here. This is only for the believers of the church age, the body of Christ. And so the dead in Christ shall rise first in resurrection power. Then, the next split second, then we who are alive, see that? We who are alive and remain. We're still working and eating and drinking and sleeping. We're just carrying on as usual. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Instantly translated. We shall be caught up together with them, that is, the resurrected saints who have died and resurrected, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Not on Mount Olives. In the air. There's a meeting in the air where we then uh, will be escorted, you might say, back up into glory. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right, now we put this back on the board in just plain, plain diagrams. Before the tribulation stage, and I've got it up here, but let, let's put it down here where we can see a little more of our timeline. All the way since the building of the body of Christ, saints have been dying and buried. They're in the grave, wherever around the planet. But when the trumpet sounds and Christ leaves heaven, and it says he's going to bring the souls of these who have died. And remember, they've gone up to paradise now since Christ ascended. <clears throat> and they are in attendance in Christ's presence. We don't know their state or anything like that. The Bible doesn't tell us. 
but we know that they're waiting for the great resurrection day. And the souls of the departed Christ will bring with him, and they will meet their resurrected body here with Christ in the air. Maybe I better back this one up just a little bit and uh, so that we keep the, the analogy that as Christ returns into the air, all the dead in Christ will be resurrected and they will be reunited with the soul that has been with, with Christ in glory. And then in that last split second, we who are alive and remain will be changed and we will join that whole company and we'll go back up into glory with Christ to be with him when he returns. Now the way I've usually put it as I've taught it, here Christ comes for the saints. Here he comes back with the saints. Now, I've got one minute left. Turn back quickly, if you will, because you've noticed here that he comes to the air. Now go back to the Old Testament again, to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah, now that's the next to the last book in your Old Testament. So just find Matthew and flip back to the left and through Malachi, and then you'll find Zechariah. Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 4. Now here is the language of the second coming. Paul says, we meet the Lord in the air. The Old Testament prophecy says, Zechariah 14, verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and so on and so forth. You see the difference? For the church, he only comes to the air. At the second coming, he comes to Mount Olives. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.